Hello and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press EL Team webinar. I'm Laura and I'll be moderating today's session along with my colleagues Julia and Eve. During the webinar you'll be able to hear our speaker Ben Goldstein and to see his slides but you won't be able to see Ben himself. You won't need a microphone if you want to ask a question please use the question box and I'll make sure to ask Ben at the end of his presentation during the scheduled question and answer session. Please make sure you've muted your microphone so everybody can hear. Ben will be playing some videos in the webinar today and there may be a few seconds pause while they load, depending on your internet connection. All videos will of course be in the webinar recording which will be on our blog and on our YouTube channel within the next two weeks. You'll be able to download your certificates for attending the webinar from an email which will be sent to all attendees again in the next two weeks. So I'm very pleased to welcome Ben Goldstein as this afternoon's pres pres uh, president <laughs> presenter. Um, ben Goldstein is a teacher, teacher trainer, materials writer and international conference speaker. He's co-authored the secondary course book series Eyes Open and the adult series English Unlimited and Evolve. His main interests lie in intercultural and identity issues, visual literacy and English as an international language. So over to you Ben. Thank you very much Laura and uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, uh, to introduce, to give you this uh, webinar, the changing the role of video. Nice to see people from, well, many from Europe, uh, Switzerland, Romania, Ukraine, also further afield in Vietnam. So welcome to everyone, uh, wherever you are, and I hope you in, will enjoy this session. Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, video in, with specific reference to uh, some videos from the new teen course the Cambridge University Press has published called Own It, but I'll also be speaking about video in general, uh, particularly at the beginning of this talk and how uh, the role of video is, is changing rapidly. And But I should say that I'm going to be focusing mainly in this webinar on exploiting video and not creating video, which would really be a, a whole other talk in it. Uh, uh, on its own. So um, we'll be talking here about video exploitation more than and video creation. So let's get started by looking at an overview of the session. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, our learners today and how our learners are, are evolving or changing, how their needs are changing uh, and what we can do about that. And I'll be referring to the Cambridge Life Competences Framework, which some of you may have heard of um, in relation to this issue. Then I'll be talking about the role of video in general, as I just mentioned, as being the kind of uh, central topic of the webinar. And then we'll be looking at exploiting video more specifically with reference to two clips from Own It. And I'll be talking about how we can extend the video exploitation that comes with the course. So extra ideas uh, specifically related to uh, skills and competencies within the Cambridge Life Competencies Framework. And then we'll, be we'll make a few conclusions. I'll be speaking for about 40, 45 minutes, and I hope there'll be questions at the end. So there'll be, there'll be time, 10, 15 minutes uh, for, for questions. Okay. So let's look at uh, the first uh, bullet point, our learners today. Um, and there are lots of different questions now where, uh, concerning our learners and that, that I think are important for us to focus on. So. We are language teachers, all of us recognize that that's what we do, that's how our, our profession is to teach the English language or to teach language, if some of you maybe teach other languages too. But um, I think it's also safe to say that we uh, now need to be engaged with other skills as well. And here are some of those uh, skills coming up, uh, digital literacy, for example, creativity, communication, collaboration, and learning to learn. Uh, these are just some of the skills that we also you know, uh, need to teach our learners. I'm not suggesting that we do this as something separate, but as we teach uh, the language, as we teach, as we expose our learners to different elements of the language, we should also be um, also engaging them with these other skills, these sometimes called global skills or life competences as Cambridge refers to them in their framework and obviously in a talk of this nature I can't focus on all of these things but I will be focusing on uh, three of them hang on a second and here they here are sorry this is just to show you the uh, 
life competencies framework if you're not familiar with the cambridge life competencies framework there these are divided into thinking and learning skills and social and emotional skills um, and you can see there that thinking and learning skills involve creativity critical thinking digital literacy and learning to learn and social and emotional skills communication collaboration emotional development and social responsibilities all of these are of course are important at all ages um, but i will be focusing in this talk on three critical thinking two of the thinking and learning skills critical thinking and digital literacy and social responsibilities and i, I think that social responsibilities in, in in is particularly important for teenage learners um, critical thinking and digital literacy are things that people have been speaking about for quite a long time but social responsibilities i think is a relatively new category it isn't necessarily let me explain it for you if you're not quite sure what it is um, uh, social responsibilities is really understanding our role in society uh, and this involves what used to be called i think well, sometimes still called intercultural awareness understanding and describing your own culture and others cultures and discussing global issues so this is something which the series own it which i'll be talking about a little bit later takes very seriously and i think that's why i wanted to focus on social responsibilities um uh, to to an extent in this talk because i think it connects very well with the videos i'm going to show you but um obviously with all of these life competences there is a degree of overlap and so when we look at some of the activities later we'll be seeing that they do there is an overlap but in other words when you're doing a task with your students whether it's related with video or not clearly you may be gauging them with a number of different literacies at the same time and i think you'll see that clearly although i've labeled the tasks later under one or of these three competencies you'll see that there is a great deal of overlap and sometimes it's difficult to say um which you know which activity addresses which competency and i wouldn't worry about that Some, sometimes i get teachers asking me oh you know so which one is <laughs> this task which which one of these competencies is it really addressing and i think in a sense um it, it, that doesn't matter uh, the, the the overlap is inevitable so let's that's just a very very brief introduction looking at our learners today and what our learners require and it's safe to say then that, that i think we need to do we need to go beyond just uh teaching uh, language we have to we have to realize that we we need to do other things at the same time and there is great value in doing those things clearly um if the material that we have can uh, help us address those competencies then all the better and i think that's one of the strengths of own it the series i'll be focusing on later let's look now at the role of video in general and this is really the less central the theme of the, of the of my webinar this afternoon so here is a a, a, a quotation from uh, well i wonder if you could tell me uh, when you think this quotation was uh, when the when the person said this Video is a supercharged medium of communication and a powerful vehicle of information. Uh, does that sound like a contemporary quotation? Uh, I, don't th I don't think it, I don't think it does. Um, this is when video started being used, and this was around actually curiously enough when I started teaching in 1991. When I first started teaching, video was something which uh, you would you would put on uh, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, after a long hard week of grammar and vocabulary it was a kind of distraction uh, and it was always kind of related with light entertainment um, but at the same time people realized that you could uh, it was packed with messages and images and, and ambiguities so it's always been a powerful powerful vehicle of information in 1991 and still today but clearly the role of video has changed enormously it is now not just an add-on it's not just a, a, an extra um bit of light entertainment but is actually integrated now into our courses and has become intrinsic in the same way that audio is to the way that we teach and learn languages so that's that's just to show you how much video has changed showing you that quotation from from over you know uh, nearly 30 years ago now um here are some quotations from teachers uh when and i planned this uh, webinar i asked teachers you know why use video what's what makes video you know what is the difference between 
uh, presenting cultural information uh, via video uh, or any kind of information via video and via text. And I think some of their the teachers' observations are interesting. Uh, a lot of teachers said this, it takes you into another world. It's a window on the world. And again, the videos that I'm going to be showing you later have very much a global significance, a, a global focus. Um, and I think that's true, that there is, it's very immediate video, much more immediate than reading uh, a text about a particular global issue, for example. Another teacher said, visual stimuli is processed faster in the brain than text. So again, we, um, we, receive, the image, we receive the information uh, faster, more economically. They communicate via video, so we should do the same with them. And again, this is related to what I said at the beginning of the webinar, that we won't be focusing today on creating video but um, with, the, with your learners. But it's clear today that, of course, the students, all of us, learners and everyone else, communicates via video um, uh, in the same way that either through um, WhatsApp messages or social media, or Instagram or what have you, or via YouTube and so on. Uh, we, well, we are accustomed to doing that. Um, more quotations about why use video. It's easier to find a personal connection. Again, this is very interesting uh, for teens, particularly in order for them to, I think, enjoy and engage, be engaged with material, they need to find that personal connection. Um, again, we can take in so much more information if, the, uh, if it is presented visually or in combination with text. So again, students are accustomed to receiving information visually uh, and they possibly can take in more information uh, more efficiently. Video, of course, is a motivational tool. And again, for teens in particular, I think for all ages, but for teens in particular, this is something uh, which is, um, is quite obvious that, uh, that it will motivate and engage learners. And of course, it's a great way to get learners engaged with the topic. So those, those um, observations there, maybe not rocket science, not something, maybe they aren't original, 100% original thoughts, but I think it's important for us to be reminded of these reasons why video is uh, so important for us to use and not, as I said, as an added extra, but now something integral to our classroom practice. And here is one more quotation from a very interesting book. If you're interested in looking at uh, the whole issue of visual literacy, uh, then you could check out this book called The Age of the Image um, by Stephen Apcon. And he talks about redefining literacy in a world of screens. And he says there, that what we're seeing now is the gradual uh, ascendance of the moving image as a primary mode of communication in the world. Excuse me. So I think that's true, and I think he's referring there to YouTube in particular and the way that, um, you know, uh, uh, people engage with video, not just by posting videos and responding via videos, but also by interacting online through comments. And this is something that is crossing languages, cultures, and borders. And here is a uh, screenager, if you like, a screen teenager. And this comes from, you've got a, a reference there below uh, from the New York Times. It's a little bit out of date now, uh, over nearly you know, 10 years old. But I think it's, it's, I guess nowadays he wouldn't be uh, looking at a desktop computer, but probably at his smartphone or, or tablet. Um, but what he says is still very interesting. Uh, he says, I'm choosing my own curriculum. I want to learn this. I can learn this right now. I'm not being told first, you have to learn this, this, and this, and then you can understand this. I just click something and it's there. And I think that's uh, very revealing as well of uh, the, the, the teenager, the need for instant gratification that uh, we can get from the digital age. And again, this is very much something which we are all accustomed now to. Uh, we need some information. We can find that information very fast. Uh, and that has kind of um, meant that we have this kind of generation of people uh, who, who seek instant gratification. Again, video is very important in this respect because this is one of the, the key ways this information can be obtained. 
Um, but it's also interesting what he, he says here, Vishal, he, also, he wants to take responsibility for his own learning. And again, this is, this is something with so much material, so much uh, uh, of our material available via video. I'm sure some of you have heard of the flipped classroom where um, video is an integral part of giving the responsibility for learners to learn outside the classroom. This is a very key difference as well, something that's happened in the last few years. Um, that students feel more empowered because they can do more uh, outside the classroom and this enhances the um, inside the classroom environment. Uh, <clears throat> related to that, here's another quotation from James Paul G. If you want to read anybody uh, who talking about the role of video uh, and also video games, then he is very worth reading and again he talks about the, I'm not going to read the whole quotation to you, but he talks here about the fact that uh, new digital technologies is changing the, the sort of challenging the distinction between formal and informal learning. Uh, and he talks about 24 seven learning and so on. And this is again, video very much integral to, to that. So I think just to sort of, if we can sum up those quotations, we can see here that there are blurring, divisions are blurring uh, between producers and consumers between teachers and learners, the amateur and the professional, and in-class and out-of-class work. And uh, publishers have been very fast to respond to this change. And as you'll see later, uh, when we talk a little bit about Own It, a lot of the material that's available now for students is available, of course, for self-study, for out-of-class work, and project work and video work uh, is often encouraged, students are encouraged to do that outside the class rather than within the class. And as I said, the extension of all this is that the students then make their own versions of the videos. As I said, we won't be able, we don't really have time today to look at that, um, but um, creating video is, let's say, the next step um, for, uh, and shows clearly that, that these divisions are blurring, that students are, I'm sure some of you have already done that, have, uh, have um, asked your students to bring in their own videos into class and to talk about them, to discuss them. And students, again, feel very empowered if they are uh, providing the input for the classroom. Okay, now, um, in terms of pedagogy and the methodology, let's look at this. The uses of video traditionally were language focus and skills practice. So. Uh, when I started teaching, you know, nearly 30 years ago now, uh, when I showed a video, it was nearly always to focus on a particular language point or to practice a particular skill. What I'll be suggesting in this, uh, and that's absolutely fine that we carry on doing that. Um, after all, you know, we are language teachers, so we're in the business of teaching language. So it's clear that there has to be some um, language focus explicit language focus to the video material that we use in class. But I think we can do much more than that. And I will be suggesting in this talk that we can use video as a stimulus. Um, and stimulus, I think we can refer to in two ways. We can look at stimulus as, 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 as referring to visual stimulus. So very often exploitation doesn't really move away too much from what is exploitation of audio. In other words, um, Sometimes we just have listening comprehension questions, and in some ways the students could have been looking at an audio and not at a video. So I think it's very worthwhile um, for students to respond to the video, um, the visual aspects of the video. Sound might sound like something obvious to you, but I do think we have a tendency to still exploit video as if we were exploiting audio, and that's a shame. I'll be showing you some examples in a moment, so don't worry if you if you don't quite grasp the idea. Um, but focusing on the visual stimulus is very, very important. I also think that video should be a stimulus as well. So not just focusing on visual stimulus, but seeing the video as a stimulus to other tasks. Um, with the course book Own It, there is actually a video at the opening of the unit. Previously, videos were seen as kind of the culmination of other tasks. Now video is being seen as a way to activate interest in a task. And that's something relatively new. Um, so again, we have used images in this way in the past. An image can be used to activate schema, activate interest in a topic. 
engaged learners. But now video is being used, and I think that's very interesting as well. So I think we should see video as a stimulus to other tasks and as a culmination of other tasks. And finally, of course, video is a resource. And here we mean, I think we're going back to what we just saw earlier, the whole idea of the flipped classroom, the video uh, can sometimes be a, a resource, can be the vehicle for which, uh, in other, for, for, for what you're learning. This webinar is, in fact, an example of using a video, uh, well, using the image as a resource, uh, the still image in this case, but I will be showing videos later. So I think this whole idea of online learning is, is where you know, content learning through video is, is, is clearly something different than the other three uses. So if we look at those, um, those four uses, I would say clearly that you, none of you will have problems understanding the top two, the language focus and the skills practice. That's what we do every day when we use video in class. What's new is the use of video as a stimulus uh, and also focusing on visual stimulus and using video as a resource. I think that's something uh, perhaps could be new for you. And we'll be focusing primarily in this webinar on the issue of stimulus. So let's have a look at a couple of examples from ONIT. Um, and I'm going to just very briefly explain to you the three kinds of videos available in the course. Um, I'm only going to really be focusing on the documentary videos, but there are three kinds of videos in, the, in this new uh, course for teens. There's the uh, language in action videos, which are focusing on uh, grammar. And these are, there are two of these which appear in every unit. And then there's the everyday English video, which focuses on uh, colloquial uh, expressions and uh, so spoken language. And these are in a, a kind of video blog format, in a vlog format, which I think teenagers will, will like. Um, and the teenagers themselves actually introduce this language and introduce these scenarios in, this kind, in these vlogs. But I won't be focusing on those, although they are very uh, worthwhile, uh, and it's, it's amazing to me, someone who's always championed the use of video, it's wonderful to see so many videos now being used uh, in a course. I think there are more than 300 uh, in ONIT. I'm going to be focusing mainly, uh, or primarily, on documentary videos, um, because I think, uh, going back to the life competences framework, that we mentioned at the beginning, these are the videos which will help us focus on uh, critical thinking, social responsibilities, and so on. So I'm going to show you, um, uh, well, I'm going to explain to you before I do that, the two kinds of videos that you'll find in ONIT. Uh, as I mentioned just now, there is an opening video, um, an information-based clip which activates interest in the unit topic, and this is shown at the this is shown at the opening of each video, uh, the opening of each unit, which is very interesting. Um, again, this is this is very different to how video is often exploited. Um, video being seen as a stimulus to other tasks. And um, the one I'm going to be focusing on in this webinar are the globe trotter videos, and these feature at the end of every other unit within the around the world lesson. So this lesson focuses on global culture, and uh, as you probably will know we're moving away now very much so from the idea of just uh, presenting target culture to our learners so <clears throat> we're moving away from uh, focusing on American and British English uh, we will feature that of course but we want to also feature lots of different uh, cultures as well in order to help the learner reflect on their own culture and compare it with the target culture so these globetrotter videos do that and it's very nice that the way they link to the cultural spread, the around the world lesson, which appears in every other unit. So um, I'm going to be sh I'm going to show you two of these Globetrotter videos. I'm going to show you one uh, A1 plus level, so a quite basic level, and then a B1 plus level, uh, a higher level. And we'll be looking at comprehension activities, of course. But as I said, we'll also be us. I'll also be suggesting to you that we can move beyond um, listening comprehension and encourage uh, digital literacy, critical thinking and social responsibilities. OK, so before we watch the first one, this is the A1 plus video, Children's Day. I just want you to think and you could type in your answer if you like. Um, do you celebrate Children's Day in your country? 
And if so, how do you celebrate this day? And when do you celebrate this day? So just think about that, maybe jot down a couple of notes uh, if you can, just for a couple of minutes. This is to also, uh, let's say, replicate how we might use this video in the classroom as well, getting students to, uh, this wouldn't be a question for students uh, necessarily, but it's an example of the way we can activate interest uh, with a single question like that. So Children's Day, uh, how is it celebrated in your culture? Is it celebrated? Do you know how it is celebrated and when it is celebrated? Okay. So while, now that you've thought about that, I'm going to uh, play you the video and uh, I hope that you will be able to see the video uh, well. As Laura said at the beginning, if you're having problems with your interconnection is a, internet connection is a bit slow, then don't worry, the videos will be available for you to watch later. So this is the video Children's Day from the level A1 plus of Own It. Children's Day. Wow, what's this? Why are there fish in the sky? Oh, I know, it's Children's Day. People all over the world celebrate Children's Day to show children just how important and wonderful they are. It doesn't matter what you look like. Are you tall or short? Have you got curly, wavy or straight hair? Is it long or short? Is it brown or black? Red or blonde? Have you got freckles or glasses? What color are your eyes? Are they brown, green or blue? What do your sister and brother look like? Or your cousins? Everyone looks different and everyone is special. And every country has got its own traditions to show children how much they care. Japan calls Children's Day Kodomo no Hai and celebrates in May. Mums and dads, aunts and uncles hang up these colourful fish kites so their daughters and sons, nieces and nephews grow up strong and healthy. India's Children's Day is known as Bal Divas and is in November. Children receive presents like clothes, toys and books. And there are many activities in the cities and at schools. In Brazil, Children's Day is Dia das Crianças. On this day in October, window washers dress up like superheroes in the city of Sao Paulo. They visit hospitals and meet sick children. This makes the children happy and puts smiles on their faces. In many countries, grandmothers and grandfathers, like this man with a grey beard, or this husband with a moustache and his wife, give their granddaughters and grandsons a different type of gift on Children's Day. A story. Today, why don't you tell someone you love they are special? Even better, show them. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you were able to see the video clearly. Um, it is three minutes long, so possibly uh, you, you, wasn't, you weren't able to, but I hope that you were and, and could appreciate it. Um, and I think what's interesting about that uh, piece of material is this focus, this international focus on 
very well chosen, I think, the idea of the Children's Day, because this is an international concept. It's a global concept, which is localized. So it's really kind of focusing on this global uh, question, the idea of global culture, which is localized in different communities. And I think it's interesting it focuses on three different cultures, Japan, India, and Brazil. Um, and again, it, it may be very different, those, what, the, how they celebrate that day, uh, and when they celebrate it may be very different to how it's celebrated in your culture and your country. And this is the kind of material, I think, which can engage learners and they find interesting to make that comparison. This is clearly engaging students with the competency of uh, social responsibilities. Um, if we look at the uh, exploitation, now, by the way, I should say that these exploitation I'm showing you here, the video worksheet, these are available as downloadable uh, worksheets, PDFs, in the teacher, teacher's resource pack of ONIT. Um, and I think this particular one is very good um, to activate learners, the, the schema, uh, before watching the videos. So they look at the photos and they give um, uh, the students key vocabulary here. People give presents, people tell stories. So again, again, what's nice about this is the idea of presence and stories being, let's say, very, very kind of global things that uh, are done in many cultures, in presence, possibly in all cultures, uh, uh, number one, number two, and number three, number four, and number five, focusing on the three different countries, the fish in Japan, the superheroes in Brazil, and the, the, the fun and, and games in, in, in India. Um, so I think this, this is, um, uh, again, nice the way that the uh, interest is activated in the video um, by showing to students how the differences and similarities between the way people celebrate Children's Day. And here is some more comprehension. So again, you'll see here the video here is exploited for different purposes, isn't it? Um, we can see here that there is clearly listening comprehension going on as well. Uh, so we are focusing on, on language here, but then there's also skills practice with the after you watch uh, in which students have to think of a special day in their culture. So that's, let's say, the, the follow up activity. But we can, as I said, I think that exploitation is extremely good, but we can extend that exploitation to focus on some of the points I made before where we spoke about the role of video in general. Remember, we spoke about stimulus. So I think we can look at, um, well, let's just remind ourselves of those three uh, areas there of the life competencies, social responsibilities, digital literacy and critical thinking. And I think we can move beyond comprehension uh, and, uh, as I say, focus on visual stimuli. Uh, and one of the advantages of focusing on visual stimuli is a clip can be used for many different levels, many different learners at many different levels. As soon as you remove the uh, language side of things, then you uh, enable the video to be used uh, in different contexts for different learners. So um, let's have a look at this activity. For example, this would be maybe a digital or visual literacy activity. Very, very simple activity. No, not complex at all. It's just a memory check. So the students look at the video. Maybe they answer the listening comprehension activities and then they stop and they we test their visual memory. So it says tick the images that you saw um, and correct the wrong ones. So which ones were the right ones, which ones were wrong? I don't know if you can remember now. Maybe you'd like to look at that at all in the short. Did we see these images or not in the video? I'll help you because we don't have very much time. But so we saw at all in a short boy. We didn't see brown, gray, and blue eyes. We didn't see birds in the sky uh, or kites of birds. I did We did see a toy box. We didn't see parents in hospital. Uh, and then we can see the uh, the, the answers that, uh, you know, we actually saw uh, people with brown, green, and blue eyes, fish in the sky, kites, fish in the sky, and children in hospital. So again, this is just a very simple idea um, to check visual memory. But again, what's nice about it is that it encourages students to think uh, uh, visually. And some students are more visually oriented than others. 
So some students will get all the listening comprehension questions right, but other students will get the more visual uh, literacy questions right. And then to move on from that, it says, what was the significance of these images in the film? So that's a more difficult question, and that's something which looks more at critical thinking, doesn't it? So a tall and a short boy, brown, green, and blue eyes. This is all focusing on you know, different kinds of people uh, from different cultures, uh, but all of us celebrating Children's Day. Um, the idea of the children in the hospital being surprised by superheroes, I think, is it was uh, fantastic. No, in Brazil, uh, shows a real uh, sense of humour. So can you see, with just a couple of little extra activities like this, we can just uh, change the exploitation a little bit, moving away from language and moving cl closer to visual stimulus. And then moving beyond that to creativity and social responsibilities, we could look then at what would the students next be able to do? Um, well, they could create their own Children's Day lo logo or create their own Children's Day celebration. And then if they're choosing the celebration, they can tick what they would include. So would they, would they include costumes, music? Would they include special event, events or activities? Would they, are they for everybody or are they for particular kids in need and so on? So it's kind of an extension again of the task in the downloadable materials. And then uh, looking at the material that uh, comes available with the video, here we can see different languages. Some of you may be from these countries, I don't know. Um, but uh, the students can look at this, these different um, uh, posters celebrating Children's Day, and then they can identify the countries. Um, how do you know? So you can see Turkey, uh, we can see Turkey here, uh, Spain, uh, Germany. Um, it says, why is Children's Day celebrated all over the world? Why is it such a special day for all societies? And this is a much, much more sort of thinking about critical thinking. What other days are like this? So, for example, uh, the day of the you know, Workers' Day, or May the 1st, uh, again, is something which is generally uh, celebrated all over the world uh, as universal kind of concepts to be celebrated. And finally, here's one more example I thought of from the internet. This is the Wikipedia page. And again, this is the logo, the Wikipedia logo for Children's Day. So, again, our students, you know, what different elements can you find in it? Well, there you can find different children from different ethnic backgrounds, we can see toys there, uh, and so on. We can see different letters of different alphabets, and maybe the students can identify what uh, languages do those letters come from, or those characters come from. Um, so we can see there, just by looking at that video, a very short video on Children's Day, we can see how we are exploiting the video from uh, multiple uh, perspectives. Language focus, yes, listening comprehension skills practice but also focusing on the visual stimulus and the video as a resource for discussing other issues related with children's day okay let's do the same thing very quickly with one more video this is from the b1 plus uh, level so i'm showing you a video from the lowest sorry the most basic level and from the most from the highest level uh, and again uh, so here you'll see that the, 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 the language level is quite a lot more challenging. And again, the question that you would ask students before watching this is, you know, what does happiness mean to you? And again, you'll notice some similarities with the previous video. Instead of uh, India and Brazil and Japan, we'll be focusing on other countries like Costa Rica and Norway. Again, this global focus is something which is very typical of these videos, the Globetrotters videos. So think of that question, what does happiness mean to you? And then let's watch the video and see if uh, the answers coincide with what you thought of. Happiness around the world. What does happiness mean to you? It could be spending time with your friends or family. Doing a hobby that you really enjoy. Or that satisfied feeling you get after you've put your heart into a project. We can't be happy all of the time, of course. Feeling down is normal. But we can always help other people to feel better.
is this the route to happiness? This is Costa Rica in Central America. This small country is famous for its relaxed lifestyle. Experts say that Costa Ricans enjoy good health because they have strong networks of friends, families and neighbours. Work is not the most important thing in life here. The same seems to be true of Norway. In this beautiful country in Northern Europe, the average person only works 27 hours a week, which means they have the opportunity to do volunteer work in the community and spend time outdoors. Spending time outdoors is also important in the South American country of Ecuador. Ecuador is the first country in the world to give nature legal rights, which means that any Ecuadorian citizen can go to court to try to protect and preserve the natural environment. Is the protection of nature the way to happiness? The country of Bhutan, between India and China, has made happiness an important goal. And the Bhutanese believe a certain type of education is the key to achieving that goal. In Bhutan, an education doesn't just mean getting good marks in school, but also learning to be kind to people and to the environment. Just like Ecuador, Bhutan is trying to protect the natural world. The country has promised to make sure that 60% of its land will be kept as forest. Perhaps looking after and being in nature is the way to feel happier. Or maybe what matters most is just being healthy and having a good time. Whatever your definition, bear in mind that happiness means different things to different people. What does it mean to you? Okay. Um, whoops. Excuse me, sorry. Sorry about that. I just got a little bit confused there with the. There we go. So um, again, I think a very nice video for encouraging social responsibility and an interesting choice of countries as well. Again, not typical. Uh, in fact, it may be the case that many uh, students wouldn't even know where Bhutan was. So that's a very uh, interesting concept. The idea of looking after and being in nature, uh, being central to your sense of happiness. I think is a very um, perhaps a, a quite a novel concept for many people. And again, the same activity we saw before, focusing on visual stimulus. You know, what images of happiness do you see? Just doing a visual memory check could be uh, a really nice task. So remember, I don't know, just remember, I can think of the, the boy playing the drums at the end of the video there is something that many teenagers might relate to, you know, feeling happy playing a musical instrument or whatever uh, and uh, again it's not the, just the concept but the visual uh, recall re remembering that uh, particular image is something that we can easily uh, work with with our learners but again the activity in the photocopyable uh, sorry downloadable worksheets is again extremely good before you watch the same question I asked you what makes you happy uh, put them in the order of importance then they watch the video and look at uh, the different countries and the concepts of happiness in each. Uh, and then after they uh, look at the significance of particular terms, legal rights, going to court, uh, getting good marks at school and so on. And then uh, they, there's a discussion question where we look in detail at um, you know, the concepts of happiness and which things you think are the most important and so on. In terms of extension, here's an activity that occurs to me, a critical thinking activity. Uh, is, is a nice one. What's the best summary of the video? A, B, or C? And again, um, this kind of task, this kind of global comprehension task, is a, often much more worthwhile than you know looking 
listening for specific information. If a student can answer this question uh, correctly, then they have understood the essence of the video, I think. And I think that clearly the answer there is C. And in terms of the uh, um, digital visual literacy, again, an extension of this could be what images do people post on social media of happiness? So we saw lots of images there of people doing being happy, being in nature, playing the drums or whatever. Um, what images do people post on Instagram, for example, of happiness? And are these, you know, could be one plus now, we're at a slightly higher level, we can be a bit more sophisticated in our interpretation. Um, what are the similarities and differences? What are the people trying to communicate uh, by posting these images of, of happiness and so on? So we can begin to, to interpret images more and not just describe them. Okay, so I think we're just about, yeah, I should be uh, winding up now. Um, so just, I hope that you've seen there from those two videos, how we can exploit video in different ways, how we can extend that exploitation so that with the, the exploitation you have in your materials is all is fine and good, but there are other ways that we can exploit them. And as I said, focusing on the stimulus uh, and visual stimulus is, is one of the ways we can do that, focusing on critical thinking and social responsibilities. So in terms of conclusions, I think we have a, a new role of video, going back to the role of video in general and moving away from those specific examples to conclude, I think it's worth uh, recalling what I said at the beginning that, at, you know, when I first started teaching and many, if some of you have been teaching a long time, you'll know this, the video has changed, you know, without, you know, it really has changed enormously. Um, and uh, as I say, the exploitation particularly, we it was often focusing on comprehension only, which was very much how we would exploit audio. Um, it wasn't integrated to other work. It was seen as something separate. It was seen as something light Friday afternoon, is what I mentioned before. Um, and it was often inauthentic material that was specially prepared for the learner. And nowadays, I think we can see the visual dimension is exploited more. And I've suggested some other ideas for doing that. Um, video is integrated into course books and programs. Own it is a perfect example of this with uh, four or five videos in each unit integrated in different uh, aspects of the course. And as I said, it can be seen as a stimulus to or a culmination of other tasks. And I think that's very important. The video can be the starting point for an activity and not just the end point. And we need to Think of video now in terms of authentic material and uh, genres which learners can then produce themselves. But as I said, that's really another another uh, webinar. And finally, then five more bullet points, beginning with E: explore, extend, engage, exploit, and empower. I think uh, explore the visual stimulus of video. We've seen that clearly in this uh, webinar. Extend comprehension tasks to including those focusing on other competencies. Again, we've seen examples of that, I hope, uh, in practical examples in, in the webinar. Engage learners with motivating topics. So I think, again, the two videos for, for teenagers, the, the happiness one and the children's day for the different levels, are very appropriate and, and motivating and can extend to other tasks. And exploit video as a launch pad uh, for or the culmination of other tasks and other skills. And finally, and I said, as I said, this would be the next webinar if I do one for Cambridge, empower learners to make their own videos and provide classroom input. So the best way for a student possibly to respond to a video is by making their own video. So maybe that video of what happiness means to you, student could make a silent video. They wouldn't, even need, wouldn't necessarily need to have to uh, provide uh, language necessarily. It could be just images and then the students could talk about it. You know, these are images, these are things that make me happy. That would be a lovely way to respond to that uh, classroom input. Okay, um, if you're interested, these are some references and I have written a book on digital video um, with Paul Driver called Language Learning with Digital Video. Own It, of course, is the series that I've been referring to throughout uh, this webinar, which you should check out. And here there are also two other references, the age of the image and video, which I mentioned uh, previously. So we have 10 minutes um, for questions. Um, are there any? <laughs> These are my... Thanks, uh, that was great. Thank you for that. Well. 
Okay. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, please type them in the uh, question box. Um, but while we're waiting for some questions, um, I wanted to ask what ideas you had for, because um, not, I mean, more and more teachers do, but not everyone always has access to, um, uh, is able to show video in class, yeah. every class. Um, so how could you do this in a sort of flipped classroom model? Well, I think um, that's, I mean, again, it always depends on the context of use. And that's a very good question, Laura, because, um, you know, it, we take it for granted that all teachers can use video at all times. And clearly that is not the case. However, um, I think the videos can be downloaded. Uh, and uh, if so, the students can, could, in theory, watch them beforehand on their own devices. It's probably more likely they will have uh, a smartphone which they can watch videos on or a tablet. Um, so I think uh, that's, you know, it, it also if there's an online, if the students are doing uh, elements of the course online, that's, there could also be another possibility for them to, uh, to watch the video um, at home. In general, with, uh, I think it's important though, with the flipped classroom scenario, that um, teachers, you know, they have to make sure that all the learners are, are going to do it because it does save an incredible amount of time in class um that's true but it only saves time in class if if everyone does it and so <laughs> there has to be some kind of um motivation on the part of the student i think with, with the flipped classroom scenario you know uh, that model works very well but it only really works if everyone has the access and will do the task otherwise it's extremely uh, it's actually more time consuming because the teacher has to navigate between those students who have seen it and those who haven't so I think that I think in terms of the, I think the flipped model is good, but I think it has to be established at the beginning of the course as something that uh, is you know is clearly an element, a methodological element of of that um, of the pedagogy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, well, we've had a question in. Um, not sure who it's from. Um, asking how many uh, how many lessons do you or I suppose could you exploit? exploit one video oh how many well i mean a, a short video a, a three minute video like the ones we've seen uh i think that's you know uh, would only really be a part of one class um the question is whether you extend the video to include you know project work or you know for example what i just said about that video what does happiness mean to you i mean it strikes me that that could a lovely extension activity could be as i said tell your students to um doesn't even need to be make a video they could just bring in images couldn't they images that make them happy images on their phone that make them happy or that suggest happiness to them and they could maybe turn that into a little um kind of collage and talk about that now in terms of classroom time that wouldn't be very much classroom time that would be homework that the student would do outside class um but then you would be using classroom time to for the students then to talk about their videos or images in class later so it really does depend on how much you choose to extend the material if you just used the material which comes with the video like we saw from own it maybe with one or two extra activities i can't think that would last more than um you know half an hour to 45 minutes in class if you choose to exploit it outside class and get students to provide their own input then that would be much longer Yes, no, that makes sense. And that was uh, that was from Jennifer Kramer. So thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, and Larissa Cavalcanti has come in with a question: which which genres are more likely to work in language classes? I guess I guess she means genres of, of video. Mm. Well, I think the vlog is a classic. I mean, people don't get tired of vlogs. So the idea of the video blog, you know, the the that that you that uh, YouTube has, has sort of made so universally popular. Uh, in own it the video blogs the vlogs there are i mean the teenagers are talking straight to camera you know it's just face to camera so these are so easy for students to replicate themselves that it strikes me that you can't go wrong with that genre now within that kind of vlog there are all different kinds of other genres so very popular with teenagers is how to videos so getting students um um to make a, a you know a how to make a you know a cake or something like that or how to fix uh, something uh, 
Um, these are universally popular and particularly popular with, with teenagers. So I think the, 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 it's a difficult question to answer. It depends on what you want the video to, you know, the role you want the video to have. If it's informational based, if it's content, then obviously you want something more cultural uh, and documentaries are good for that. If you want the students to respond with their own video, um, then I think you want to go for something which students can replicate easily. So therefore I would say a, a face to camera style genre like the video blog. Lovely, thank you. Um, and I mean, happiness, the, mm. the video you showed earlier, there's a, you know, it's a big question, isn't it? And there's lots of these quite big yeah. um, theoretical questions. How do you get teenagers in, engaged in those kind of big ideas? Is that something that you think is easy or have you got various ways of, of thinking about that? Well, I think that I think that's a very good question. I think that's exactly why video comes in because I think that's a kind of metaphysical question. <laughs> think about it. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is for the this is the B1 plus level of own it. So you know we're talking about kids who are now a little bit older, are starting to develop, uh, you know, the kind of sensibility. But you're right. You know that those are those are profound questions, um, and it's precisely there where the video makes much more immediate impact. And has an, an immediate effect. If you were to just read a text on that, you know, in class, it just wouldn't. It wouldn't have the same appeal, and it wouldn't. The message, I don't think, would get across so efficiently. So I think that's exactly where the the video comes into its own because it can make a quite, as you say, quite a you know, profound uh, question. You can make it quite accessible, and it can make their response to also could be quite accessible so in the, you know what what does happiness mean to you if i then say to you oh, look, look on your phone now and find images of the you know when you were happy you know that's a very simple thing to do and that makes that kind of de-intellectualizes it you know what i mean and, and mm. i think that i think that is is the beauty of the video of the, of the visual image not just video video and image this immediacy we saw that at the beginning why is video so useful and i think I think you asked a good question there because I think you're right. Some of these questions are very big uh, and um, difficult for us to unravel <laughs> as adults, as teens. You know, it could be it's, it's even more difficult. And video can help us a lot in that respect. Mm, and arguably, you get probably get some quite interesting answers. Yeah. Um, and so we've just got time for one final question. Um, uh, from okay. Sheila Davies. Uh, she says, with the prevalent negative image of the effect of social media on teenagers, how could you address this using video? Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, what, what does she, I'm not quite sure what she means about the, uh, how do you interpret that? In, because I think there's a lot of very uh, positive social media. Well, in terms of YouTube, I don't think I can see anything particularly negative about it. I mean, it has a very negative press, YouTube, but in actual fact, I think we are seeing wonderfully creative videos being made, you know, students responding via video, um, learning through video, learning English accidentally, informally um, on social media, um, through video on YouTube. A different question, I think, with, with issues like, you know, Facebook and Instagram, perhaps with, uh, I suppose, she might be referring to, you know, the image, uh, you know, or, or, or of teens, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, jealousy and, and, and body image, things like that. Do you think she's referring mm. to that? Right. Well I, well, I mean, I guess your, your activity about looking at um, different images of happiness that students might yeah. have or share is a great way to sort of tap into, you know, is this real or is this perception, um, uh, you yeah. know, students recognising that perhaps there are different yeah. representations of happiness other than just the traditional Instagram image. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to get at with the question I asked about. I mean, uh, I think that's the, the idea that they reflect a little bit on, you know, the images that, that we do put up on social media of happiness. This is sort of happiness. We're just focusing on this particular example. Yeah, they, that can mean, you know, someone is showing off or wants to, you know, is, is, is trying to compete and so on. And this is, this can be, you know, 
destructive necessarily, but can be it, it can really torment some teenagers because they feel they don't you know they don't have such glamorous lives or they they want to feel that they should look like or behave like someone. Um, I agree that these are all issues which are I mean these are these are these are prevalent, um, and uh, and I think it's it's important for us to reflect on them. But I but I I, I would accentuate the positive. I, I agree all those things exist, but I think I think that there's so much positive things that we can refer to with the use of video in, in at least in something like YouTube, which is where you know you don't necessarily know everybody who follows you or who comments on your your video or your work, you know, or I think that that's where we've seen video being used so much to forward and help people's English, you know. All those video game forums where students are learning, you know, getting tips of how to play different games in different languages, you know, from different people in different parts of the world, all through English as a lingua franca. I mean, the examples like that uh, are so positive. Mm, um, no, but, I think but that's you're only right. one. But that's only one kind of social media, isn't it? Uh, I do agree. We do need to be very careful uh, about um, about using. You know, social media. We, I mean, we do need to keep. We need. We do need to. Uh, once students are able to articulate, we need that kind of critical. We need. We need to give them and provide them a, a, a critical voice, you know, so that they don't take all these things at face value. Absolutely, and I think you know you've touched on it uh, earlier in the presentation, but you know, video is is one way of helping students develop their critical. Yes. Their critical yeah. eye. So. Um, exactly. Uh, you know. It's a, it's a good forum for it at the ELT classroom, I think. Yeah. Um, well, that's all we've got time for today. So thanks so much, Ben. Um, that was thank really, you. really interesting. And um, thank you all for attending. Um, don't forget to check out our events page for details of upcoming webinars, which you can visit cambridge.org slash ELT events. Um, and as I said at the beginning, the recording of today's webinar should be live on our blog and our YouTube channel within the next couple of weeks. Uh, for more information about um, Own It, which is the course you saw uh, videos from today, uh, you can go to cambridge.org slash own it. And your certificate for our today's webinar will be uh, available to download via email in the next couple of weeks as well. So thanks so much to everyone for attending. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Have a lovely afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ben. Bye. Bye.